Um, welcome to our session. We are the sixth and final session of today, and our subject is the management of delinquent party behaviour. So I'm Karen Goff of 39 Essex Chambers, and I'm going to be chairing the panel. I have six speakers for you, and all with a particular take on the subject of delinquent party behaviour. Their bios and contact information you will see in the conference pack. I will say a few words about each as I introduce them in turn. So my speakers are going to refer to real cases and then explain how they managed them and what the takeaways were. We hope you find it both useful, but also entertaining. We think the experiences will resonate with many of you involved in adjudication or arbitration in whatever capacity uh, you are involved. As you will see, delinquent party behavior takes very many forms, often dressed up as legitimate tactics. Uh, and my speakers will explain to you why that is just not the case. Housekeeping, very briefly, I'm sorry to tell you that Jeremy Glover is unable to be with us today. His talk about party behavior during the DAB process will be picked up by Giovanni. In advance, Giovanni, I thank you for that. Questions, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat or the Q&A and we'll try and pick them up. So going straight to my first speaker, who's um, certainly delivering above and beyond since he's traveling. My first speaker is Justin Mort QC. Uh, he's really a man that needs very little by way of introduction since he's well known, if only by his seller reputation as a leading construction silk from Keating Chambers here in London. He's based in London, but he's represented parties in major energy and infrastructure projects located all across the globe. Commentators say he is singled out for the strength of his intellect and his vast knowledge of the technicalities of the construction bar. Justin is setting the scene for us all and sharing his views on the role of the adjudicator and their relatively protected status. He'll be inviting us all to behave, I suspect, and focus on getting our cases heard. Justin, over to you. Karen, thank you very much. If I can just begin by saying thanks very much to Sean Gibbs for organising this excellent conference and asking me to contribute. And thank you also to Karen Goff, QC, for keeping this little group in check. And uh, thank you also for your comments just now, which were very, very generous. As indicated, I'm on holiday in France driving to uh, my house and it would be, I feel, only appropriate to thank the authors of the NEC3 contract for their contribution, albeit indirect, to the cost of this holiday and the house that I'm going to. Uh, I appreciate that comment may be open to misinterpretation, I'll leave you to puzzle over it. Uh, the Wi-Fi in the hotel I'm in is 250 kilobytes per second, which according to my IT advisor, does not actually qualify as broadband, but if, I, uh, if you can't hear me, that's why. Uh, we were told by Karen to uh, keep our five-minute sessions short and to make them amusing. Her exact words were, uh, our session is the only thing between uh, the conference attendees and an alcoholic drink, so you must make it funny. If I can just say, if you, if you reach the stage of your life where you can't go beyond 4 p.m. without an alcoholic drink. I have two things I would say. The first is, uh, God bless you. The second one is, well, one thing we've got out of this dreadful pandemic is a benefit of remote conferences is you can do other things while people are speaking. So if you want to pour yourself a very large gin in order to get through the next 60 minutes, do please do so. I will not be judging you and won't in fact uh, know. Uh, I would also add that my uh, career uh, ha has been entirely devoid of comic, comic moments. Some people did laugh when I won uh, Parkwood and Langer Rock in front of Mr Justice Aikenhead, but I think it was a hollow laugh rather than a belly laugh. Uh, we were asked to talk about our experience of delinquent behaviour, particularly in adjudication. Obviously, I have a lot of experience both as a party representative and as an adjudicator over the last 23 years. In fact, I, I was studying adjudication at King's under Professor Kappa and John Up, uh, just at the time the original legislation was, was going through Parliament and being enacted. Um, I, I'm a great uh, fan of adjudication, as I think everyone no doubt on this conference is. It's an incredibly effective and successful way of resolving disputes. 
uh, I think it's, it's slightly misunderstood. Um, my own view is that the role of adjudicator is an exceptionally easy one uh, compared to other jobs that one does in, in dispute resolution. Uh, I think the fact that there's such a large supply of adjudicators is, is possibly indicative of that. Uh, of course, within the context of adjudication, there may be very exceptionally rare occasions of actual bullying by a party or threatening or improper behavior. And that, that's obviously unacceptable, particularly if it involves lawyers. Uh, and I'm not, I don't think that's the, the intent, we're not in, intended to discuss uh, that, that professional misconduct of that kind. Uh, what, what I understood this, this session is concerned with uh, uncooperative behavior or parties trying to abuse the adjudication process. And my take and my experience as an adjudicator and as a party representative as well, the key point to bear in mind is, firstly, the adjudicator is never going to be criticized for uh, getting the decision wrong. Uh, secondly, that in terms of the procedure, uh, the adjudicator gets to decide the process or, or should do in, in the vast majority of adjudications, for example, any, any adjudication under the scheme. And that means there should be very little excuse for an adjudicator uh, getting caught out or having difficulties with parties. They get to decide uh, what happens when and what consequences if, uh, if they don't happen. They get to impose, uh, to set the sanctions, they get to decide uh, who's going to do what and in what form. And uh, I would suggest that adjudicators, if, if it's not obvious to them, uh, should think at the beginning of the process uh, about having a hearing so that uh, nobody can complain they've not had an adequate opportunity to present their case uh, and should think in terms of imposing limits uh, to the number of submissions and uh, what length they're going to be as the time goes on. A related point, uh, as, a, as a party representative, I always feel, and my clients always feel a bit cheesed off, if the other side are allowed to put in new evidence that we're then not allowed to respond to. And I appreciate it's often said in the court cases, well, adjudication must have an end. You can't just have a limitless number of submissions. But it does always strike me that as an example of what I'm talking about, it's very easy for an adjudicator to say, well, you can put in new evidence, but it must be limited in volume and you have a limited time to submit it. And the other side must have some limited opportunity to comment on it. And I, I never quite understand why an adjudicator can't accommodate that, even if it's simply, well, you've got six hours or a day or whatever, and your comments must be limited to two sides of A4 or, or, or whatever's appropriate in the circumstances. I appreciate and we're well aware that adjudication can be an enormous burden on an adjudicator. But for the reasons stated, it seems to me that they have complete control as to how they manage that and how they ensure that they achieve their very limited uh, task uh, without difficulty. Thank you, Karen. Justin, thank you very much. Not least for being rigorously strict with the time. I'm very grateful. My next speaker coming up is Lisa Kantanak. Lisa joined Construction Dispute Resolution Limited in May 2000 as a contracts consultant and in 2009 became a director. Lisa is a registered adjudicator with the RICS in Scotland, the RIBA, the CIR, the Scottish branch of, and UK adjudicators and has been appointed or involved as party representative in over 110 cases. Lisa is an experienced negotiator, an accredited RICS mediator, and an accredited RICS expert witness as well. Lisa is past chair of the Scottish Building Contracts Committee. Lisa will be speaking from an adjudicator's perspective today about dealing with a difficult respondent who participated on and off and then complained about natural justice issues. I think most of us have been there and was generally disruptive to the proceedings. Lisa will say how she managed that level of disruption. Lisa, let's hear from you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Karen. And also thank you, Sean and the UK adjudicators for inviting me to speak today. I'm going to talk about an adjudication that I acted on a number of years ago. I thought it'd be an interesting tale for today in demonstrating the balancing act between natural justice being served and getting the decision issued in time. The adjudication was between a builder and a homeowner and the homeowner 
to the contract were a husband and wife. As is normal practice, I wrote to the party setting out the timetable for the adjudication. And at this stage in the proceedings, the referring party was represented, but the respondent was not. However, I then received a letter on behalf of the respondent from a solicitor advising it was re representing the respondent. But that didn't last long, as two days later, the respondent solicitor advised it was no longer representing it. There was an underlying difficulty in the adjudication due to the fact that it was a joint respondent, i.e. a husband and wife, and correspondence was being received from them separately. Following the solicitor advising it was no longer representing the respondent, the husband then sought an extension to the date for submitting the response. I agreed to this short extension against the backdrop that I'd been advised it was no longer being represented and it appeared to me that it was now representing itself. However, I then received a letter um, on the date that the response was due in um, from the respondent, the husband, um, to advise that he was no longer able to participate in the adjudication and I previously had a letter saying that the wife was unable to participate in the adjudication. So, the period that followed, I received correspondence on behalf of the wife um, on the, in the adjudication. It was not legal representation, but it was from another family member. And at this point, whilst a response hadn't been received, in the ongoing correspondence, there was a jurisdiction challenge in respect of who the parties to the contract were, which was supported by affidavits provided by members of the respondent's construction team. I accepted the affidavits into the proceedings and I had noted the jurisdiction challenge, but obviously I was still in the position that I didn't actually have a respondent participating in the adjudication. So I then directed the respondent or someone on its behalf to advise whether they intended to participate in the adjudication. I also advised them that in the event that there was no response received, I would have no alternative but to proceed ex parte on the issues that were before me. I recorded that the respondent had been given every opportunity um, possible to participate in the adjudication. Um, thereafter, I received an email from a solicitor advising it was now acting on behalf of the respondent, and it was agreeing to a 14 day extension that I had requested to the decision date, and the referring party had already agreed to this. So therefore, I then directed a further timetable or revisions to the timetable, set out what the date for the response was, set out what the date for the reply was. The response was received, which included a further jurisdiction challenge in respect of there being no contract between the parties. And given the different versions of event regarding who the parties to the contract were, I took the view that a meeting was necessary to hear witness evidence, as it didn't all just turn on the records that were provided. Prior to the hearing, however, the respondent advised that one of its attendees was unable to make the hearing as it was on holiday and requested that the referring party agree to a further two week extensions to the timetable in order that we could delay the meeting further. However, by this point, the referring party had had enough and it refused on the basis that the process had already been extended twice as a consequence of the respondent's actions. Given this, there was no scope for me to alter the date of the hearing as it had to be accommodated within the current decision date. So the hearing went ahead. However, during this, it was agreed that the respondent solicitor would contact the attendee that wasn't there to ascertain their availability in the early part of the next week to participate in a conference call in order that questions could be asked of it. However, it was made clear that the conference call would only be possible if it was to part in the early part of the next week due to the pending decision date. The respondent was unable to resolve the matter and the con conference call wasn't able to be accommodated. The respondent objected to this and reserved its position in this regard. However, the timetable just didn't permit any further extension and as such, I proceeded to issue my decision based on the evidence that I had before me. There were a number of twists and turns in the adjudication, with matters being complicated, as it noted, about the respondent being represented, then unrepresented, and it really was a balancing act of ensuring that natural justice was being served, but also being able to issue the decision by the decision date, and allowing myself sufficient time prior to the decision date in order to be able to review the submissions and prepare and um, come to a decision. 
So whilst it may seem favourable to ensure that both parties have their opportunity to have their say, sometimes circumstances simply don't allow that and you have to draw the line. In this case, the respondent objected to the fact that I didn't convene the conference call. However, the parties had been advised that there was a very narrow window of when it could take place. And at that stage, the respondent was unable to confirm whether the witness actually was able to participate. And I took the view that given the decision was imminent, um, I had no alternative but not, not to go ahead with it and proceed to make the decision and consider the affidavit, ev affidavit evidence that had been provided. Ultimately, the matter ended up in court and one of the issues that was considered was whether natural justice had been served given the lack of the conference call. The judge held that the decision was due to be issued within a short time scale. I had the benefit of having heard evidence at the hearing, had the affidavit, full legal submissions and a substantial body of documentary evidence. Therefore, I could not be criticised for having to proceed without having, having proceeded without the conference call and therefore there was nothing to suggest that my decision was contrary to natural justice. Karen. Lisa, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No, Lisa. Thank you very much for that. Sorry, I wasn't sure if I was on or off. Uh, thank you very much for that. That seems like some kind of baptism by fire, which we'll all sit here and pray never happens to any of us. Although I'm sure a number of people in the room have had similar experiences. Thank you very much for that. My next speaker, my next speaker is Paul Checkett. Paul is a fellow of the RICS and the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and has been practicing as a claims consultant since 1995. He's worked in Asia and Australia for 20 years, including acting as a dispute manager for the Japanese consortium on the Taiwan High Speed Rail project. Paul specializes in dispute avoidance, claims, and acts as a quantum expert as well. He's currently acting for the employer on the Hinkley Point C Nuclear New Build, advising on COVID claims. Something you won't read about Paul in his CV is that he's a scuba diver. Paul has dived around the globe, but since being locked down in Cheltenham, one of the UK's towns he tells us that is furthest from the coast, he has instead taken up the piano, uh, which I thoroughly applaud you for. Paul's going to speak from the perspective of a dispute manager with a substantial M&E contractor. And Paul is going to draw on his experience of a 1990s dispute with denial of disclosure requests, followed by a flood of documentation and other contentious behaviour. And he'll tell us how it was resolved. Paul. Thank you, Karen. And uh, I'm going to be uh, uh, daring to uh, use a couple of slides as well. So if you can bear with me. Uh, so the project I'm going to talk about uh, is called the Nanyang Polytechnic in Singapore. Uh, it was a new build, design and build construction, a very large development, uh, about 16 buildings, including lecture halls and theatres and studios and halls of residence and some science labs and a lot of media study complex sort of uh, rooms. The dispute itself was obviously in Singapore. It was an arbitration. Uh, I'm a very big fan of adjudication, but this one sprung to mind as a good example about the delinquent behavior. Um, and it was basically between uh, the contractor who was uh, the Japanese Development Corporation or JDC and GEC Marconi, who were the M&E and comms and IT systems contractor. Uh, and it was one of those projects that just went horribly wrong. Yeah. Uh, so I think as, People all know in arbitration, we used to have discovery and that was pretty much uh, the kitchen sink where you got everything. Uh, and this was evolved into disclosure, which was meant to be less extensive and a bit more uh, user friendly for everyone and a bit more cost conscious. Um, but the reality is that parties still try to disrupt, disrupt the process and they uh, conceal the, the reality of um, the, the evidence that is not persuasive or not beneficial for their case. Um, so obviously this is arbitration, but adjudication, there is a, a degree of similarity. Uh, so the type of obstructive behavior that we came across um, was really extensive and extreme. Um, 
every time we got any documents or any access to documents, they would be misfiled, the files were uh, wrongly labeled, somebody had rearranged the contents, uh, somebody had just literally muddled the files up on the shelves, and there were thousands of files. Uh, key documents in particular were never in the file where they were listed on the index to be. Uh, there was lots of excuses why these documents you know, weren't there or didn't exist. Um, attachments in particular were never attached. So you could find a covering note, but none of the uh, work that went with it. Um, and there was a huge amount of material relating to you know, different projects um, and sometimes even projects that weren't even in Singapore. Um, so there was this massive information uh, that we were trying to struggle our way through. Uh, but we also we had some preliminary hearings and there we had witness statements from you know, the project manager from the contractor referencing documents that they had not disclosed anywhere um, and so we were again were pointing out all of these inconsistencies and saying look we know these documents exist uh, you need to give us access um, being a japanese company they were also saying that board meeting minutes and the project meeting minutes were all stored in japan and therefore not available to us um, and when it came to the programs and the planning aspects, there was no files available whatsoever, either in hard copy or soft copy. Um, this behavior went on for months. We took up the issues with the tribunal. Yeah, it was a lot of uh, management time from everybody's perspective and very difficult to uh, uh, not to end up spending a lot of money um, and delay the hearing. So what I then thought was, what was the point of this behavior? And um, we, we thought about it a lot, and what we realised was that um, the other side really thought they had a very weak case, and all they were trying to do was delay any award whatsoever. Um, I don't think they thought they were actually going to get a positive outcome, so they, their preference was not to get an outcome at all. Uh, I hate to say it, but they had a claims consultant who was definitely feathering his own nest. He was enjoying his hourly rate and was happy for that to go on as long as possible. They had project managers in particular who didn't want to expose their performance, uh, which they knew had we uh, progressed with the case, that that would have been, yeah, that would have been so. They also had a client that was very cost conscious and didn't want to spend money on a legal team. And so there was very little input from lawyers who I think would have probably put it on a uh, more even keel and insisted that they act a bit more uh, appropriately. And, uh, what we didn't know at first, but we became evident later on, was that uh, uh, the parent company in Japan was really struggling, and therefore they were trying to protect the parent company from a, you know, a negative award as well. Um, so on that point in particular, what happened was that the hearing was delayed. We got an acknowledgement of costs. Yeah, costs would be considered in our favour um, as a result of the, uh, um, the actions and the behaviour. Um, but at the same time, the contractor then made a call on our on-demand performance bond. Um, we fortunately had a Singaporean bank that gave us 24 hours notice. And in that time, we were able to apply to the courts on the basis of uh, bad faith uh, to say that the bond should, you know, should not be paid out. Um, and one of the key aspects of our defense in that matter was the fact that this uh, obstructive behavior had delayed the arbitration extensively. And had it not been for that behaviour, um, we would have actually already got a, yeah, an award in our favour. Uh, at the same time, we also demonstrated that the contractor's parent company was on the brink of administration due to some very poor um, property land deals in Japan relating to golf courses. <clears throat> so the outcome of that case was, um, was beneficial for us. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so... What I've thought about was what can you take away from that? Um, I think there's a couple of things that I wanted to flag up. Um, what you need to do at any point in a, in a dispute like this is question people's motives as to what are they doing and why are they doing it? Uh, and it's good to bring transparency to yeah, the tribunal to explain, this is what is happening. This is what we think is happening. Uh, and it was the evidence that we put forward to the tribunal, which we then used in the court to uh, stay the uh, call on the bond. So that, that was very beneficial at the time. Um, 
We also found that once we understood the pressure on the parent company and the reasons why they didn't want to uh, progress with the tribunal uh, with the trial, uh, we then started to talk to them more sensibly about ways of settlement rather than just plowing on with the arbitration. Um, so despite people's delinquent behaviour, I think you always have to try and find a way of talking to the other party to understand their perspective and to build that trust and relationship such you can find a settlement, um, which I know is very difficult to do, but um, I think is a very positive attitude, despite some people's uh, unwillingness to be reasonable. Uh, Karen, I might be a little early, but uh, that was the end of my little talk. Oh. <laughs> Brilliant. I've terrorised my panellists to the point where they've all got alarms. Paul, thanks very much for that. Um, my next speaker is Philip Harris. Philip, if you've got um, an alarm, you can turn it off. I'm watching the clock for us. Uh, Philip Harris is the solicitor whose practice is an adjudicator for more than 20 years and is on no less than six national panels. He's a chartered arbitrator as well and receives appointments from the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, the Law Society, and the LCIA. He's a faculty member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and has set exams and coursework for arbitrators. He's also a CEDA accredited mediator and a partner in the construction team at Wright Hassel Solicitors. He permits me to say this, outside of work, he's a keen runner and won his first race, he tells me, at the tender age of 60. Congratulations. <laughs> Philip is speaking about poor behavior in the context of parties denigrating each other and being gratuitously offensive and, and council not helping the situation. And he will tell us how he kept his cool and managed a really difficult situation. Philip, over to you. Philip, you're in glorious Technicolor, but we can't hear you. Ah, it looks like you've got sound now. Philip, do you want to try and dial in on a telephone or something so that we can at least hear you? And then I'll get Ian to carry on with his presentation and come back to you in a minute. Shall we do that? Thanks very much. Okay, well, um, Ian, let me come to you. So Ian Aitchison, having started his career with Arup, Ian is now Managing Director of Ankara in London and has specialised in expert witness and advisory work since 2010. He's a registered architect in Germany and the UK and is a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and the DBF. He's given expert evidence in ICC arbitration on delay and FIDIC contract administration issues. He sits on several international arbitration panels and is listed on the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators dispute board panels. Something not on Ian's CV is that in his spare time, he enjoys telemark skiing and alpine climbing, and he climbed the Eiger in 2006. Ian's going to speak about experts misbehaving in both adjudication and arbitration and the consequences, or indeed the lack of them. He'll provide his insight as to how they should be managed. Ian, let's hear from you. Okay, so thank you, thank you, um, thank you to the conference for attending, and of course to, to Sean for organising this extraordinary event in these extraordinary times. So, I mean, just to go slightly off piece to start with, as it were, let's uh, start with the price. Now, if we go back a little bit in history, Sir Robert Walpole, who was the first British Prime Minister, is reputed to have commented uh, on his peers that all the, all those men 
half their price. Now the press in its um, unique sort of way reported it rather differently and perhaps more succinctly and simply said all men have their price. So given that background is not necessarily relevant to construction law, but what should the parties do? The parties should do the right thing. And the general advice is to hire an expert and simply hire the best expert that money cannot buy. So what should the experts do? Well, my view for the expert, the rules are actually quite simple. You need to be an expert, you need to do the homework, and you need to tell the truth. So the watchword is integrity. And in theory, there should be no delinquency if there are independent experts on both sides and both, and both of these experts respect the rules. So where do the problems start appearing? Well, the first problem is it's not really an effective sanction for experts that misbehave in adjudication or arbitration. And there are experts who, for whatever reason, neglect their expert duties. And there are clients who will hire them and there are lawyers who will find them. But it doesn't really stop there. I think the classics that we've all seen are, for instance, issuing the documents in formats that can't be worked with or exploiting the timings. I think we've heard other speakers um, speaking to these points, but we should really be beyond that type of behavior now. One of the more subtle things that sometimes happens is you get a, a well-meaning party for instance, in adjudication, who starts making concessions in their contract administration during the adjudication process. And by, do the, by doing that, they actually undermine the independent experts' um, independence, essentially, because it appears that the party is following the advice of that expert. So that, that can be an issue. But I think it's, it's probably relevant given the short time just to pick up on a couple of practical examples of things that we can all be looking out for. And again, this may overlap slightly with previous speakers, but I think it's, it's important to say it and to say it clearly. The instructions are certainly something to be looking out for. And when an expert has been instructed in a particular way or instructed to make particular assumptions on particular facts or dates or whatever, there's usually a reason and it's usually an important reason. So these instructions are typically within the hands of the lawyers. What the expert can do is he can highlight the effect of the instructions and on the content and the conclusions or potential conclusions of the report. And this, this sort of thing is, is, is quite an obvious question for cross-examination. Sometimes the expert will signal the limiting effect of their instructions by writing that if they were instructed differently, their findings could also be different. That in itself is telling. But it's unlikely, except in arbitration, for there actually to be a hearing. So many of these adjudications, it's all done on the documents. So it's unlikely that the experts are actually going to be challenged on the instructions. So in practice, the expert needs to decide whether or not the instructions are reasonable and whether these instructions, if followed, will actually allow the expert to give their true and complete opinion, because that's what's actually relevant. And it's maybe hard on the expert, but the reality is, if these instructions are too restrictive, the best advice is probably not to accept the appointment. I think in terms of practical solutions to this particular problem, one of the, one of the things could be to make the whole process of the instructions more transparent and make the communications between the party making the instruction and the expert receiving the instruction um, to become available to whoever is making the decision. So the court or the, the arbitral tribunal, or in this case, the, the adjudicator or arbitral tribunal. And that might actually be quite a a good way of reminding the expert that their overriding duty is to that decision maker, to the adjudicator or arbitral tribunal. Now, the, the second point, um, or the second, second example, is on expert meetings. Now, the plan for these is that they should be without prejudice and they should be objective. 
professional conversations between the experts. And this is fine if both of the experts come from systems that actually understand that concept and understand how to manage it. Um, but in practical terms, the experts need to agree fairly early on that the discussions need to be between the experts. It's the function of the, the expert meeting and not too much going back to the lawyers or the parties behind the lawyers. Um, because if this can't be agreed, then it can quickly get into a process that can be tainted with the feeling of dealing with a remote controlled expert. Or in terms of my delay work, um, you could end up dealing with a critical path that changes according to what one of the experts perceives to be um, the liability. And that can become very challenging. Now, in my experience, the uh, expert meetings are actually quite rare in adjudication, but it can be quite scandalous in, in, in how, how they, uh, they unfold. And the simple reason is not because anyone's necessarily doing anything wrong or being actively delinquent. It's simply because on one side, there could be a claim consultant. More often than not, that's on the contractor side, perhaps somebody who's actually written the claim on behalf of, of the party. And they're going in passionately advocating the case. But on the other side, there's an independent expert trying to do the right thing. And it comes down to this imbalance that essentially these two individuals are going into the meeting in an asymmetric situation or with an asymmetric agenda. And the reality for the independent expert is standfast integrity is actually only the only real defense. You just have to hold the line. So um, what I just finished with, um, with um, a lovely quote that I, I love from, from Max Abramson, who summarized it really memorably. And what he said was, if experts were always expert in the first place, fewer arbitrations would be necessary. And if they could agree in the second place, many arbitrations would be shorter. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Ian. That was really instructive. I took from that integrity, slanting of instructions, and don't accept them if they're too slanted and they affect your opinion. I think that's really good advice. Thanks very much indeed for that. Philip, are you able to talk to us yet? No, he's looking at me rather blankly. So um, if I can, Giovanni, can I call you on and, and save a few minutes for uh, Philip at the end in case he can join us? So Giovanni, if I can introduce him briefly, is certainly one of Italy's national ADR treasures, but generally to be found either in Romania or even the Middle East. He's a civil engineer in his primary profession. He's well-known international arbitrator, adjudicator, and expert witness in delay and quantum. He's a FIDIC member and sits on the FIDIC president's list of certified adjudicators, the ARIC president's list of approved adjudicators and experts, and he's a FIDIC certified adjudicator and FIDIC accredited trainer. He's a president-elect of the Dispute Resolution Board Foundation Region 2 Board, and president of Techno Engineering and Associates Group, and a visiting professor at the Polytechnic University of Milan in Italy, where he lectures a master's in claims and construction law. Something not on Giovanni's CV, where any, whenever he gets the chance, he says he likes to go scuba diving. Giovanni, I don't know how you find the time for any of this. Um, today, he's talking on the subject of difficult behavior experienced by dispute adjudication boards, focusing on obstacles in the appointing process, and also some misbehavior during the proceedings themselves, picking up on the points that Jeremy would have made if he was able to join us. Giovanni, over to you. Thank you, Kevin. Many thanks to Sean for inviting me and organizing such an impressive conference. Over the past 22 years, uh, while acting as a dispute board member, um, there have been uh, instances where one of the parties has obstructed or tried to obstruct the 
under the appointment or the smooth running of uh, the dispute boards once established. Um, there were not many cases over the past 20 years. The phenomenon in my uh, experience uh, presented itself um, during the past eight to 10 years. Um, my experience has been always only on the fitted conditions or contract um, type of projects. Um, what I will have uh, has been the case in some of these uh, few instances uh, is that the obstructing party has been always the employer. And um, this has been, in my view, always a rather curious uh, because uh, it is the employer in one jurisdiction or another that imposes the fitting conditions of contract onto the tenders and then the contractor that is awarded the project. Uh, and then the party that actually required the contractor to fulfill the provisions of the clauses where a dispute board is appointed and is required is the party that is delinquent and that tries everything that not to have uh, the dispute board appointed or run as smooth as it should in the principle of fitting. Set that aside, uh, the guerrilla tactics that have been used by these uh, uh, obstructing employers uh, have been in a way childish in some instances and unprofessional in the sense that uh, when the contractors proposed uh, the appointment of the dispute board, they uh, basically stayed uh, silent. Uh, they didn't even bother replying to the contractor's requests. Um, when obviously pushed uh, by the contractors, they have tried other tactics by saying that they were not happy with the proposals for dispute boards put forward by the contractors. And they uh, obviously were not agreeing on that. Other tactics were that some of these employers proposed are adjudicators that they were not qualified to do that. And obviously the contractor uh, were against it. Uh, what happened in most cases, the contractor got tired and they adopted the uh, fallback provisions in the contract, uh, whereby they can request the appointing authority to uh, make the appointment. And uh, under FIDIC conditions of contract, when the appointing authority, usually FIDIC, but it can be ICC and ICE as well, um, that appointment, when made by the appointing authority, it's finally conclusive. Um, when that was done, then the employer were not happy with that, and they refused to sign the dispute adjudication or the dispute board agreement, which made it very difficult. And I had to resolve it by um, explaining to the parties and to the contractor that uh, I had to proceed. And if it wished to proceed, uh, a, a, a just a, a contract between the contractor and the dispute board would have surfaced. Um, as a dispute board agreement, and that providing that the employer would have been kept in the loop and always required and requested kindly to participate. However, the, the dispute board had the duty uh, because of the final conclusive appointment uh, to proceed and, and hear the dispute. Um, and, and that was done and, and was accepted also in arbitration that the, the dispute board acted properly and that the dispute board decision was valid and enforceable. Other tactics uh, of the England employers uh, that I had come across uh, happened after the appointment. Uh, if with some pure luck, uh, the contractor managed to convince uh, the employer to have the board appointed, and they reluctantly did. Uh, then obviously once the board was appointed and trying to have the first site visit, uh, many excuses were, were offered by the employer not to have it. And in the end, I 
I had a duty to proceed and, and it was uh, performed only between the contractor and myself and the other members of the board. Um, other type of behaviors is that during uh, a referral of a dispute, uh, the actual uh, position of the respondent being the delinquent employer was at the time uh, agreed uh, for um, replying to the statement of claim was inadequate, that they were a public authority and they had to um, undergo a, a, a tender procedure and that would have taken 60 to 90 days and all kinds of excuses, uh, which in the end uh, created a situation that the, the dispute board had to proceed ex parte, and I did. These are the most prominent behaviors, which somehow, I don't know how this happened. It's in whichever jurisdiction this happens, they are followed almost to the T, like they speak to each other. But I would assume that it's just, you know, uh, human behavior to, to quickly find the, the, the same excuses to avoid or obstruct the process of uh, the dispute board and of dispute avoidance and adjudication. I'm going to stop here so that I stay within the time and I thank you again for listening. Giovanni, thank you very much indeed for that. Philip, we could hear you, so hopefully Hello. you can now present. Ah, so, um, I do apologise. The floor is yours. I do apologise indeed for not having sound. It's probably better without sound, but, but there you go. Um, yeah, my, my scenario is a very simple um, scenario. So I'm adjudicator in an adjudication. Um, and uh, the referring party is a large entertainment company, which owns a substantial amount of land. And the um, responding party is a builder, a substantial builder um, and the issue is that um, uh, land which was being developed um, by the builder still has asbestos in it so really a failure to to remove the asbestos that was the, the nature of the dispute um, the responding party the builder is represented by a senior counsel the um, entertainment company the referring party is represented by a solicitor but it has a sort of larger than life managing director who's also a witness we get to the hearing because um, both parties have put in witness statements and uh, obviously one was on mars one was on venus and so the, i decided to hear from the parties to to try to to get to the truth as it were um the Barrister proceeds um, several times to refer to the managing director of the entertainment company uh, as a liar and says that he's lying and also refers to a criminal conviction that he has, but has nothing uh, to do with the dispute. The managing director um, becomes quite irate and, and disruptive and um, interrupts parties. Uh, so... The way I deal with it is, um, as regards the barrister, I say to him, you know, please, can we use more neutral language um, if you think uh, Mr. So-and-so is incorrect or he's inaccurate, please use that kind of language. But um, let's not use emotive language like um, calling him a liar. And uh, as regards the managing director, and really taking up on what Paul was saying earlier, um, engage him in conversation, um, show that you um, have a measure of respect for him, good manners, um, but that you understand his position. So one of the things that I would transpose from the mediation process is uh, my mantra in mediation is people see things in different ways. And I think that's a very important mantra, people see things in different ways. Um, and so the person who's being disruptive, you know, doesn't believe he's being disruptive. He thinks he's um, being he's, he's in the right and he's doing the right thing and everybody else is against him. Another thing that I, I think um, is important is that 
many people regard the process as artificial um, and they see it as game playing. Um, and uh, I think one of the ways you can deal with that, one of the ways I deal with that is sometimes to say, um, uh, yes, Mr. So-and-so, we all have our parts um, to, to perform in this um, dispute. So you're actually anticipating somebody's hostility to the process and saying, we've all got our roles to play in, in Let's all make sure we play them properly. I'm the adjudicator. You're the witness in this situation. Let's all um, play our roles um, effectively. And I sometimes say it's a strange business, one man or woman sitting in judgment on another man or, or, or woman. And I think that helps you know, to show that you can, you can see um, this sense of artificiality, this resistance to artificiality and respond um, to it. And I think it's very important to say that uh, it's an ADR process. Um, adjudication is an ADR process. And generally speaking, um, it is consensual. Um, so you're there because the people have chosen you to be there. Once upon a time, they agreed that you would be there. I do acknowledge that um, with scheme adjudications, it, it, it is a different kettle of fish. And I think there's an important debate as to the difference between scheme adjudications and um, consensual adjudications, um, but that's for another day. Um, so I think we're not judges. Um, we can entertain an element of emotion um, in the process, whereas perhaps a judge can't, he has to be um, more uh, clinical. Um, but we're not, you know, we're not imposing authority um, top down. We're there because we were chosen um, to be there and I think it's important to bear that in mind and I think your your authority comes from a legitimate intensity that you have focus uh, as an adjudicator you're doing your job properly you have that focus uh, that, and that's why you're there if you haven't got that intensity that natural intensity it's probably not going to work but as long as you've got that natural intensity you shouldn't have to be too authoritative so Karen I'm uh, Apologies for all my uh, failings, including not, people not being able to hear me. And uh, there we are. Thanks very much. Philip, that was worth waiting for. Thank you so much for that. We don't have much time less, and I'm very reluctant to run over at all, not least because Sean will be on my case. But I think let's try and finish on a positive note here. I want to run through each of you in turn and you could each tell me what one behavior you would encourage the parties to adopt when they appear before you. Take about half a minute each maximum. Paul, I can see you in the corner. You go first. I'm so pleased you chose me there, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking 30 seconds to think of an answer would be good. Um, what one behavior? I think that integrity and openness is the obvious um, uh, trait that you would love to see as an adjudicator. Uh, if you thought the party was, yeah, uh, taking part in the proceedings in a, in a professional and appropriate manner and being sort of transparent and straightforward, uh, you would feel quite comfortable yeah, in, in dealing with them. Yeah. So that would be my simplistic answer. Thank you very much. Lisa, what do you say? Oh, Lisa, can, yeah. Um, I would say assist the adjudicator. Don't try and put traps in their way and be obstructive. Um, even if you're the respondent and you don't want to be there, um, the adjudicator is there to do a job and regardless is going to do that job. So you might as well help them get to the decision at the end of the day. Thank you. Ian? from my side what I say to parties uh, when I first meet them is to be open with me tell me not only the truth but actually tell me the things that they perhaps don't want to share so that I can really form an opinion based on a rounded understanding of all of the facts and not just the ones that are convenient to their case. I think it's a great point because very few of us have the per perfect case there's something wrong with everybody's case and actually just trying to camouflage over it all the time doesn't actually do the good part of the case uh, any good at all. Giovanni. I would say act in a collaborative manner. 
professional and courteous, but more than that to act in good faith uh, because the contract has been signed by both parties and the ADR procedure, in my case, uh, adjudication has been agreed by both parties. So there should be no reason to act in uh, an improper manner. Thank you. Philip. I think uh, simplicity is, is welcome uh, to use plain language, um, to use simple language. And once you've used it to summarize your position simply and um, I echo what other people have said that, uh, you know, assists the, the adjudicator. He's got a difficult task, but uh, uh, simplicity and uh, a plain summary at the end, that would be what I would recommend. Well, just to summarize you all, I don't think I, I was looking um, for Justin Moore, but I can't see him on the screen anymore. So obviously the hotel Wi-Fi has got the better of him. So just to sum it all up, thank you all very much indeed. And basically what it comes down to people, um, do be collaborative, do behave professionally, be courteous to one another and to the tribunal. And uh, that sort of behavior is the sort of behavior that impresses a tribunal, be it an arbitration tribunal or an adjudication tribunal. You make a big mistake if you think that the tribunal hasn't seen it before and doesn't know what it is that you're up to when you start to play tricks with them. They just do. None of it is novel. So uh, again, to my panel, thank you very much indeed. To Philip, I'm sorry you had all those troubles, but as I say, it was very worthwhile waiting to hear from you. To, to Giovanni, to Paul, to Lisa, to Ian, and to Justin, who's left us. Thank you all very much indeed. And Sean, thank you very much for giving us this platform. We've enjoyed